because I care a lot about my identity and I'm cool and I'm tough and I'm a jungle explorer and all this. And I walk in and I just said, I have all of these symptoms, but you can't see anything. And maybe I was going crazy. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Now, we don't want you to worry about taking too many notes, so you can join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club, and we'll send you the transcripts and show notes from every episode. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, welcome everyone to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's my pleasure to be with you here again on another brand new episode. My gosh, I'm down here in Florida and having a wonderful time just traveling and exploring the world as always. I always do, working down here a little bit and getting to know amazing people. And that's exactly what happened. I love this when this happens because we have a mutual friend. Her name is Alicia Datner. She's an awesome comic. If you haven't had a chance to check her out, check her out on um, the internet or catch one of her shows because she's hysterical. But she introduced me to Maria Fadiman and she said, you got to talk to her. And I'll tell you, I absolutely have to. This is how Alicia sent me a note about her. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not sure Maria knows this, but so it says, you've got to talk to Maria Fadiman. She's a National Geographic explorer of the rainforest and professor who has done two TED Talks. She is a powerhouse, one funny woman. She has a one-person show discovering her autoimmune disorder, dealing with it, and getting back to being a badass international explorer, even with an illness. And I was like, heck Yeah. So (laughs) we'll get into more of Maria's amazing bio because I just loved (laughs) Alicia's way that she describes her friend, my friend now too. It's so funny. We're just within a half an hour of each other as far as distance goes. So welcome, Maria. Thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to talk with you. And Alicia told me quite a bit about you as well. So good connect. (laughs) Good connection. That's what it's all about, everyone. Part of the Thriver community is learning from each other and being willing to connect to each other. And that's what the Courage Club is about. And you can also find us over at Understanding Autoimmune on Facebook to have connections there as well. Because that's where we learn about a lot of the unspoken things about autoimmune disease. <laughs> All the little things that other people forget to tell you if they're not going through it themselves. But how, Maria, how did you find out you had an autoimmune disease? So I was actually, I was about to give my second TEDx talk and I was nervous and excited and suddenly my skin was hurting and even the air on my skin felt like it was burning and I, all of my muscles were seizing and I couldn't even bend over. And I thought maybe I've stressed myself into going crazy because I have no idea what's happening and I don't have time for this because I have to go give a TEDx talk no matter how I feel. And so I just pretended all of this wasn't happening and I, and I, sucked it up and I went up there for the the TEDx and this was, I was in Cancun, Mexico and the adrenaline of the talk luckily got me through that. And then afterwards I thought, do I Google this or do I not? And so I just started to Google. And of course, as we know, it either meant that nothing was wrong or I was going crazy or I was going to die. I mean, I got all of it and I thought, okay, that was a good choice. (laughs) And I I really didn't know what was wrong with me. And it was so mysterious. And I went to one doctor's, I'm sure people go to many doctors. And I had a super swollen node. And she said, well, maybe the swelling of the node is affecting your nerve endings. And just no idea. So she uh, prescribed antibiotics. 
So after five rounds of antibiotics, and I would prefer not to take antibiotics in the first place. Right. They're hard on our gut. They're hot on our gut. And I know there's other ways to do things. And I just couldn't figure out what was happening. And I was starting to, I hadn't totally lost my mind yet, but I was starting to also feel a way that I don't. I'm fairly upbeat. And it was suddenly jags of crying and feeling so desolate. And it was all falling apart. And I went to a, my husband actually said, why don't you talk to this, this other doctor who I had gone to years before for some weird thing that had come out of my armpit when I was in the jungle. And he just thinks outside the box. And I walked in and it was that moment where I was so afraid he was going to think I was crazy because I care a lot about my identity and I'm cool and I'm tough and I'm a jungle explorer and all this. And I walk in and I just said, I have all of these symptoms, but you can't see anything. And maybe I was going crazy. And I mean, it's getting me choked up. He looked at me and he just right away said, mycotoxins. And I said, what's my mycotoxins? I had no idea what he was talking about. And he said, uh, let me give you some articles of which I understood none. They're all in medicalese. But basically he, from my symptoms, he, he's an allergist, but he's just seen a lot of people and thinks this way. He recognized that probably I was having an autoimmune reaction and that one, I wasn't crazy. And two, um, that it was real and it was something that I could address. And I feel so grateful for not feeling grateful for having, for having this, but that he recognized it so early on and that I, I could then start to work from there, which was a lot of drama from there on out, but at least um, I knew now what was happening. Yeah, there's a huge uh, members of the community who talk about it took years to find the right diagnosis that started them down the path of, of optimizing and healing. And it's interesting to me, I want to explore this area of I'm not crazy, because I hear that a lot. And I also struggle with that off and on. It's interesting, I find that it's almost a physiological response as well. And that I'm not sure if it's a chicken or egg, but there are days where all of a sudden I'm weepier than normal, or I am more anxious than normal, and nothing is happening to make me that way. <laughs> And then I, I mean, you know, it's not like outside forces going, okay, Sharon, start crying, you know, something happened. It's just, I wake up that way. And at first it was women your age, Sharon. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yeah, stop that. Uh, you know, perimenopause, menopause, all of that kinds of things. But one of the things I have found out was a lot has to do with stress and diet. What are things that you found out that you kind of going, it's, it's a crazy reaction, but I'm not crazy. Yeah, so certainly stress plays a large role in it. So probably the fact that all of the symptoms suddenly just presented themselves so strongly right before a TEDx talk. I, you know, my immune system, I think I was heightened. All my adrenals were not doing what they should have. So that makes sense. So in some ways, oh, I wish I'd never happened. But in other ways, I think, well, I'm glad I was at that level of anxiety. So I now know what this is when it presents itself in other contexts. So for me, it was actually a huge relief to find out that literally one of the symptoms that they list for whatever, I mean, it's a general autoimmune disorder is feeling weepy and feeling angry and feeling irritated because I'm a lot of things and certainly getting stressed is a big one, but being angry and so sad, that, that's not really my Actually, that, that's not really who I am or how I see myself. So when I get those reactions, and it's not that I never feel that. So sometimes I think, well, this is just really terribly unjust. You know, that someone has dropped a pencil on my foot and it, it really warrants my crying and feeling like a victim and all of these things. Um, so I often have to say, mm, wait, maybe I've had an exposure. So for me with the mycotoxins, the a substance that mold produces. So I wonder what well, did I have an exposure? Did did perhaps 
it, this thing is not warranting this, this huge reaction. And where this comes up a lot is, bless his heart, my husband, um, he will say something and I will have this huge reaction. And then he will say, well, maybe, maybe, you know, you've had an exposure. And sometimes I feel like, no, I haven't. That's, you know, what you've said is absolutely what is precipitating this, which could happen. But sometimes it's because, I mean, the words I feel is like I'm not in my right mind. And knowing that that is precipitated by my immune system or by something in the environment that has made that happen helps me at least realize, wait, I still am myself but there are times when I'm behaving in a way that is a symptom of my condition as opposed to just really now I find the world such an egregious place, which I don't. I think I love the world. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way. And it's interesting, fascinating to me how much I've discovered in the healing journey of that sort of emotional realm that like, Am I crazy realm um, or getting outbursts of is precipitated? I never thought about it before the diagnosis. It was either it was just emotions. It either was or it wasn't. But now I realize I have to stop and say, okay, I'll backtrack and almost like reverse the video to see, okay, what happened? You know? <laughs> right, exactly. To to be in the moment and then think, wait, 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 did something happen? with my condition or with my surroundings that led up to this. And the thing is, sometimes I really am just upset. So that happens too. You know, exactly. You know, so sometimes I think, well, you know, I can be a little emotional anyway. And, and it's, it's trying to figure out, is this emotion appropriate for what's happening? And to be emotional is fine. And I cry anyway. It's not that. But when I, when I can't stop crying, then I think, mm, that doesn't feel quite right. Yeah, that's what I found interesting myself and for what I hear from members of the community. It's a, a stopping process that I never used to do. Stopping and trying to figure out, okay, is this warranted? Am I really <laughs> emotional? Is this like, is this, or is this, um, is it out of scale? Is it out of proportion to what's happening? And so I never used to think about that, but <clears throat> well, a growing process, right? Now I'm just curious with mycotoxins, which molds, and I know you live in South Florida, so my goodness. <laughs> Let's talk about a place prime for that. But you also go into the craziest jungles and, and rainforests and things. How do you do that with this condition going on? So that is, that is a great question because so much of this for me in many ways is about my identity. I see myself as a going off into the jungles and that's who I am. And I've been doing it for so long and I love it and it fills me up and I believe in it. And when this was first happening and I, and I was having so much trouble just getting my feet on the ground and figuring out what was happening, going off and doing that again, I, I couldn't picture it one way or the other. I felt like I couldn't even picture my life again, how it had been. And my life now not, is not as it had been, but I move forward now with how it is now. And it's a combination of having really great doctors who have helped me with a protocol. I, I take more pills and supplements than I ever could imagine, and I try really hard not to gag as I take them. It is really helpful, and also I've committed that I want to not only feel better, but I, I want to toughen up my immune system and get myself as healthy as possible, that even when I have an exposure, I can work with it. And the reality of how that works with what I'm taking, I, I know that helps. And also I have just decided that this is who I am going to be. And I also making the choice to potentially expose myself. That there are times when I'm healthy and I just feel like, wow, if I don't take any risks, I can just feel good. And then I realize that's not me. That... I need to do what I need to do. And when I get an exposure and I start to feel the symptoms and I have an absolute meltdown of PTSD and the whole thing, and then I remember I'm going to get through this and I now have help and I know what this is and, and I won't be in the same space. So it's a combination because also living in Florida, part of it was our house that had it and all of that. So for me, almost home is where it is more angst making 
because that's where you live. When I go somewhere else, I, I was booking a, a hotel somewhere and I thought, well, let me get one with a porch in case I have to sleep out on the porch because if something's wrong with the room. And so going out into the jungles of Latin America, and the savannas of Africa, it's a combination. Partly when I'm outside, I'm safer for my particular issue. So the rainforest is full of molds of every kind, but when I'm outside, they all compete with each other. So I'm not trapped with just the mycotoxins of a certain kind. So when I'm outside, that's a safer place for me. No, you do, I do tend to sleep inside places. And um, I also take, by now, bring a little blow up pillow with me because having whatever you're laying on is what I'm breathing in. And it was a huge issue the first time I went back to the field. I hadn't been back since I was diagnosed and I had gotten a grant to go to Africa. Very excited. And there's certain things I do that need to be refrigerated, which I couldn't bring with me. But I have all of these pills, like over 50 bottles of pills. And um, I thought, okay, I need to bring these with me to Africa. And my doctor said, well, why don't you bring the bottles of pills? And I was, I was going to be gone for a long time. And the thought of counting out how many bottles were in each, because I take four of these three times a day, two of those, da, 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 doing the math and having this huge suitcase full of pills. I was like, I can't do that because I'm cool and I take a backpack. <laughs> Let alone going through customs. <laughs> oh, well, yes. So so I, I got all these bowls and I, and I tried to order little travel plastic bags for pills and that didn't work because they were too small. I had too many pills, but then I went big plastic bags. So I ended up Googling things and I went on a construction website and that's how I ended up finding little bags into which people put nails and screws. And, and I was like, oh, I can put my pills in here. So I started counting out the, uh, these many, 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 many pills from many, 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 many days. And it was all overwhelming me. And um, it was actually my husband who has a degree in astronomy and physics. And he, he found the math far less upsetting than I did. He said, <laughs> just take each bottle and look at how many pills you need to take how many times a day, how many pills are in the bottle, and how many bottles you have to take. And I really didn't want to do that, and I didn't want to slow down long enough to do that, and I realized I had to do that. Because also, if something happened to my little baggies, if water got in, all of my pills would have been destroyed. So bless his heart, so he helped me do that, and I put all of those bottles into a suitcase, <laughs> and I dragged it with me to Africa. And um, when I was going through customs and I had this suitcase full of nothing but pills and um, I was going through the x-ray and the, the, the man in Africa looked at me and he said, he said, are you a doctor? <laughs> I thought, yeah, but not that kind. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, no, um, these are all just for me. He looked at me and he said, oh, and I brought up my doctor's note. I said, you know, it's okay. It's okay. I have a doctor's note. I, I, um, and he's, I said, you do you want to see it? And he said, no, no. He said, you just, you just go ahead. And in that moment, I also realized because so many people come to Africa and they bring medicine for the people who are there because they mm -hmm. can't provide it for themselves. And I was so busy feeling sorry for myself that I had to take a whole extra bag to Africa. And I also really lost sight of the fact that I am lucky enough that I can purchase all of these pills that I need to take to stay healthy. Um, but I was lucky enough that I could do that. And I was so pleased he didn't think I was coming to sell them because I thought, well, that I'm, you know, I've got this letter and that's all I've got. So I took dragged this whole bag with me to Africa with just bottles and bottles and bottles of pills. So partly also how I travel is I take all my pills with me. And yeah. it's interesting. The challenges that come from that is um, I have to have enough water, clean water to take them. So in some I'm mixing in powders and at one of the airports in Africa, they, um, he was very nice. The next group, they said, well, you have these powders, you have to taste them in front of us. 
and, and I have one, it's Prevalite, and it, it sucks, it all the spit out of your mouth, and it's this fake orange flavored thing, and I was, and I totally forgot to feel lucky, like, yay, I have to have all these pills, I was like, oh, but I need to have enough water to mix that in with, and then I need to have enough water to take my pills, and I need all of this to be clean and potable, and often I'm having to boil water, or, or putting in iodine tablets, and all of this, so that was a challenge I hadn't expected, was literally having enough liquid to get the pills inside my body to be able to, to function. And I travel differently now also. It was so, so much of what I love to prove is how tough I am. And that would show when I'm out with an indigenous group in the rainforest. And they say, okay, we're gonna walk to this really far away place. And I say, oh, I can do that, no problem. And, and I, in many ways, earn my respect from these people by showing I can physically do what they can do, which of course I can't, but that I can do it at all. And now I have to be more aware and I can't necessarily do everything. And I have to own that and let them know that. And still, and this is the part that's hard for me, is still that I'm okay. Still I can go out there. I'm still tough, but not quite as tough as I was. And when I go into where I'm going to sleep, I, I look around and again, for me, it's important for them to know I can sleep on the floor. I can sleep in a tree. I sleep on a rock and I'm so cool. And at one point in Africa, they showed us where we would be sleeping and it was a, um, an old piece of foam mattress. And for me, anything that is porous that can hold mold. And I'm in this very humid environment. And I can even see little moisture marks on it. And I realized I, I couldn't sleep on that mattress. And I don't want to be that person. It's so important to me to say, Psh, no problem. I'm one of you. Here we go. And for me to have to say, I actually can't sleep on that mattress. And I felt weak. I felt like a princess. I felt offensive. And these are all of the things I try so hard not to be. And I had to use this new voice inside of me that said, I, I, I need something different than, than what you're offering me so generously in a place where you have so little. And, um, and, and even before I could own that, I said, oh, you know, I'm just going to sleep on the floor. I'm good. But of course, they all looked at me like, why are you going to sleep on the floor? And I was like, oh, well, you know. <laughs> and I just had to say, you know, I, I have an auto immune deficiency, thank you so much. And I, I, I need to be in a different place. And that, that was hard for me. Um, and then when somebody was working with and they said, we found you another place to sleep. And even then I said, oh, you know, I don't really need that. You know, I said it, but, and, and, and she just looked at me and she, and she just said, she said, Marie, it's okay. And this is where I, I had to learn that it's okay. It's okay that I now have this. And, um, and there are accommodations that I have to make and that's still okay. So I'm learning how to still go out to these places and in some ways be just as tough as I was and in other places and situations I'm not. And that is also true. Mm. So I'm, I'm owning it more and I'm still working with that. Wow. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. We need to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to hear more from Maria on what it's like to be a badass traveler. And she still is. And it's all good. It's fantastic. Thank you for sharing. So real and raw. And we'll be right back. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by LifeInterruptedRadio.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. 
So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E.com. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Show. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And tonight we're talking with Maria Fadiman, and she's a National Geographic Explorer of the Rainforest and professor who has done two TED Talks. Let me explain a little bit. I'm going to have her explain a little bit more, but I don't think we gave enough background. I didn't give enough background on why is she in the rainforest? So, (laughs) Maria, share with us what you do so we have a little context of, okay, she's out there in the rainforest or in the savannas or the valleys of Africa. Why? So, right. So, so I am an ethnobotanist and when people, I say that and people look at me like, you're a hotama hotama honest. (laughs) So an ethnobotanist. So ethno people, botany plants. So I work with the relationship between people and plants and how this started for me is I always wanted to save the world bit of a large undertaking and I wanted to do conservation but I actually was afraid of science and I felt like I couldn't do it that way and so I I got my undergraduate in Latin American literature and through studying that and then I told for my thesis I said well I want to do about something about the environment and my advisor said well you understand how to read literature so maybe you can look at plants and how it's represented in my myths so I did that And then I went out, had an opportunity to volunteer out in the rainforest um, as a guide because I had learned Spanish in high school and college and I was helping another guide. And when I was out there, initially they said, be careful of the snakes because they're poisonous and we're really far out. So basically if you get bitten, that's it. And they said, don't reach under anything because they're scorpions. And they said, and spiders, spiders are everywhere. And I I appreciate the role spiders play in the ecosystem. I just don't like them. So the first night I walked to my my bed and I laid there and I was terrified to move. And I made a calendar in my head. And on the last day was the day I was going to go home. Because I thought, I I think I hate this. (laughs) I'm terrified. This is no fun. (laughs) And then as I was there and I began to learn about how to spot the snakes and the role they play and the pollination and and how everything goes together and it became more familiar. And I absolutely fell in love with the rainforest. And I also realized it was the people who were teaching me all these aspects of the forest. And I got that if I want to work in conservation, I have to include the people who live there. They are a part of this ecosystem. So that is when I began to look at it as a unified whole and then looking at how people use the plants and looking in some ways at the sustainable way they use them and also just looking at their connection because the more connected we are to a plant the more we use it then the more dedicated we all are going to be to want to preserve that plant and the forest in which it grows 
So I try and look at it as I'm not coming in from the outside and saying, here's what you should do. I'm saying, let's look at what you do do. And then through this, one of the things that I do is I work with the people to make uh, booklets of their information so it's not lost. And also so that they not only have a lasting record, but so that the young people see this is important enough to write down that it's valid and valuable, even if trying to get to the city and get some pills, if that feels easier and more exotic, to realize this information is really important. So my passion for going into the rainforest, and it started in the rainforest in African savannas, and now really any part of the world where I have an opportunity to work is, we have to save the forest. This is our world, and there's so many different important things, and this is the piece of it that I'm trying to work with. And so I feel like what I do in trying to help these people record their own knowledge with the ultimate result of keeping these forests standing in their cultures as intact as they want them to be, to give them that opportunity, I feel like that's something I have to do. So for me to continue doing that, it's almost not even a decision. This is just what I do and I care about it and I love being out there and it's really hard sometimes and it was even really hard before I had an autoimmune issue um, and I have to keep doing that. That is, that is who I am and I also see that very much as that's the role I'm playing here to do my bit for, for the world. Yeah. That's pretty dramatic. To do my bit awesome. what I believe in. <laughs> <laughs> for the world, Dr. For the world. That is awesome. And as you guys can hear, she brings the same passion to healing and the same passion to optimizing her body, her work. It's all incredibly comes from this incredible, passionate place, which I think is what propels us to keep moving forward, regardless of our diagnosis. I'm curious, though, the one thing that surprised me is I know Alicia has been helping you find the humor in it all. And you created a one person show, a one woman show about the humor of autoimmune discovering it and all. What led you to that place and going, hmm, maybe I'll make it funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, it's interesting because while this is happening um, and in the beginning, I, I write I write as a way to process. I write as a way to get outside myself and realize I could take myself a little more lightly sometimes. And in the beginning when this was happening, I couldn't write. I couldn't see any humor. I, I really couldn't see. I, I was trying so hard just every day to make it through the day and figure out what was happening and when we're throwing away everything I own and, and all of those things. And then once I, actually I was, we couldn't be in the house and I was in a hotel and I, and I woke up and there was a pizza box on the bed from last night. And I had brought my Nutribullet and I brought organic kale and I was gonna make green smoothies every day because I'm into being healthy. And I was laying on the bed and I thought it's just so much easier to reach out and grab a piece of leftover pizza from last <laughs> night than to get out of my bed and get that beautiful kale and stick it in the Nutribullet. And in that moment, I, was, I knew, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm depressed. And, in that, and, it, and it was so sad and sorry, but also I, I, I looked around at the absurdity of the situation. And I thought, this is ridiculous. And it was writing about it that helped me get me out of myself for a minute. That helped me see a little bit what was happening. And I've always actually written letters to my family and it started the first time I went to the rainforest so many years ago when I just was, and I'm like, the insects are as big as, big as small cars and I don't know what I'm doing here. And that has always helped me get over myself a little bit. So I was already writing and already noting the absurdity. And again, sometimes I can note the absurdity and laugh at it. And other times I certainly couldn't in the moment, but later on I could. When I was crying and crying because we had to get new closets. And I was so angry about getting new closets and I couldn't stop crying. And then I was mad I was crying and then I cried even longer. And then I was mad that I wasn't going to bed because I was crying and that would make me cry more the next day. And I mean, at the time, I mean, there was no crawling out of this hole. But the next day I thought, oh my gosh, really? 
<laughs> you cry about crying and you're crying and it all started off because of a closet. So in retrospect, often it helps me see the ridiculousness of the situation. Not that it wasn't real, whatever I was feeling. It wasn't really valid, but it was real. Um, and then just thinking, wow, with a little hindsight, I can, I can see how this is bizarrely humorous in a somewhat dark way. Um, <laughs> but also now that I can come out on the other side, I can also look back at that and see it with some more perspective. Right. Now, I don't know if this has happened to you, but I, I naturally try to find the humor and stuff. And I know you do too, but I would have people get upset at my attempt at humor, trying to make light of what was going on. You and I chatted beforehand, and um, mine also involves the skin, but skin rashes where the skin actually peels. And in the course of um, six weeks, I lost 60% of my skin. And as the skin, as I began to heal and the skin came back, it was gorgeous. It was really <laughs> gorgeous. <laughs> and I remember my dermatologist still feeling kind of like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And I'm like, hey, look, free laser peel. <laughs> they did not find it funny at all. I thought it was hysterical. You know, and I guess if it's like I'm the one going through it. But did you find that people are like, get real? Well, you know, what's <laughs> that's perfect, which is partly why I'm working with Alicia. So I worked on a, a show. Um, Partly to process it for myself and partly because I thought, I'm going to cry again. I would have loved to have seen a show like this when I didn't know what was wrong with me. And to see someone going through it and the more I talk to people like you and other people and, and you get people's stories. So I also wanted that out there. And there were parts of it that I thought were pretty funny because I was laughing at myself. And when I did it and, and just the, of the audience, and I realized oh, they don't know it's okay to laugh at some of this. And that was afterwards when many people said to me, they said, well, I thought it was funny, but I was afraid to laugh out loud. Wow. And I realized, ah, w which made me realize also on how I'm putting it out there that I know the parts that I'm cool with now. But I realized that if you're hearing it for the first time, it needs to be more okay for other people to be able to see that I can see the humor of this. It doesn't make it any better, but it doesn't make it any less funny either. <laughs> True. So, so it, and that was something I had to realize that I didn't, I didn't, cause it's not just a sad story. I mean, it's too bad, but it is what it is. And, and again, the absurdity of it, there's still times when I think, wow, that was bizarre when, when we had everything taken out of the house and, and construction and I was living on the porch and I had a little trail through the dust out to the garage where I kept my two outfits. I bought two new because I'd throw away all my clothes. And, um, and my husband came home and he said, you're just living in the rubble. You know, they're done. They're not doing construction. And I looked around and I, mean, I didn't even realize it. I was so deep into my little world and so afraid to go in the house. I had my little trail through the dust and I think oh my god that's ridiculous and I really thought I was like no I'm living in the house he's like no you're not it's like oh. and I realized that when people hear that they think oh my god I think, oh yeah right right yeah it was it was bad and it was absurd both and I'm not there now so I can laugh at it now right so so I have learned a bit I have to let people know it's okay they don't they don't I don't want people to feel sorry for me. And I think sometimes when I say things that, that inspire pity in a normal way, I realize, oh, maybe it's because I have to let people know also that I'm not there anymore. And, and I'm okay. And I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> we need to take one, one final quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to follow some more of this. Because I think this is part of the process of understanding what it's like as a whole. And I know from my own medical journey, it wasn't until I found the right team. So we're going to talk a little bit more about finding the team that keeps you this way, because I had to find the team with the right mindset besides the right skills. So we'll be right back. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life. 
and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.omtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for inspired conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time, we say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if we thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing? So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, you say, thank you for listening. Join us at projectforgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y. C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E dot com. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Show. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And tonight we're here with Maria Fadiman. She's a National Geographic Explorer of the Rainforest and the African Savannas. And she's a professor at Florida Atlantic University. And she researches the human environmental aspect of the world of conservation, as you were hearing all about her exciting, exciting, I just, what an amazing, interesting job. Uh, and we've been just having a really interesting talk about what it's like to have an autoimmune and how things, certain things change and other things stay the same. But one of the things I wanted to talk about, Maria, in just the last few minutes that we have are creating the team that you have that allow this all to be possible. I know it took me a while to find the right team of medical professionals that had not only the skill set for the condition, but also what I'd say the right mindset. And that was a mindset that I was going to heal. I found a lot of the people I would interview for the position of being a physician on my team. The people were like, what? You no, know, you interview them. Because what I found was a lot of them were like going down the list that Dr. Google gives you. And gosh, if I'd believed that list, I, w I would just be like, pour me in a, in a pit somewhere. So what are some things you did to find the right team? Because I travel a lot, but not quite as far flung crazy places. You, you got to have an amazing team. I am incredibly lucky in that regard. Because I know so many people spend years, one, not knowing what's wrong with them and then finding the right person with whom to work. So I went really just through, as I mentioned before, uh, one doctor who didn't know, which was fine. And then really my second doctor um, not only knew what was wrong with me, but had a really proactive way of handling it. And he, the reason why I went to him in the first place from years ago when I had seen him is he thinks outside the box. And so he says, let's use everything he learned with his Western medical degree. And he also says, let's use every possible supplement that might help with this. And he is incredibly open to that. And if he doesn't know something, he takes out this big book. I mean, he's so smart and secure. He's got no problem saying, I don't know, let's read about it. And he would open it up and read what this supplement and that supplement would do. So early on, I was lucky enough to start with a doctor who said, 
I have some knowledge of how I've been handling this and let's look at your specific situation. And he also had the attitude of this doesn't need to stop you. He said, just keep going and we're going to treat things as they come up. And he had the dubious role of having to help me understand all the things I had to do in my own, uh, my own physical environment, the, the whole, the house and the walls and the clothes and every single thing I owned, getting rid of all that bit by bit. He had to gently help me through that process, which is actually not part of his medical degree, but just part of his way of being. So that was huge. And then actually, I mean, part of my team is my mother and she couldn't make me better, but she could try and find the best experts possible to help me. And I said, well, I have someone and he is wonderful. And, but as a mom, she wanted to find someone too. So she actually found someone through someone who she was working with actually on a different solo show issue. And it was somebody in New Mexico and that person was all booked up, but there was somebody who had worked with her. And so I contacted that doctor and it was very, very hard to get an appointment. I mean, that's another thing I find is these people who are really good are booked up. A lot of us have this, even as it more and more people are getting diagnosed. And I did get in to see her and she complimented what I was doing with my other doctor. And she, and actually my other doctor, as I said, he handed me articles in the very beginning. There's this word mycotoxins. I had no idea what the word was, how you spelled it. And he gave me articles to read, and it turns out that those articles were written by this doctor that I ended up going to see. And she herself had come, had this illness, and she had now dedicated her whole practice to this. And she, again, it was use whatever we can with Western medicine and use whatever we can outside of that. And I would say, I'm stressed out. And she's like, well, that's not good for your adrenals, which makes it worse. And she would say, you know, you could consider meditating. And not that that's what she was necessarily doing, but she was really open to anything that would work for me to make this a really holistic healing experience. And I am so grateful that I have someone. And also, for me, a big thing is when something comes up and I start to get anxious, because for me, so much of it has to do with my physical environment. So... Um, suddenly I came to work, I done my whole house and I got to work and then I was sick again. And she said, okay, well, let's look at how we can address that. And things that went beyond her medical expertise and just her human being expertise. And that's huge for me to know I have someone I can say, this is happening. I'm not sure why. And she might not have the answer, but she helps me think it out. So, so in that way, I just feel like I'm just really, really grateful and lucky that I have these people and the, the first doctor is this incredible person and he's very, very old and he actually, I don't know what's happened to him the last time I called to make an appointment and he didn't use an answering machine because he's very traditional and I'm so grateful I have this other person because if I didn't and that had happened, I would have felt so lost because I always know I have this touchstone with this doctor. But I, even as you use the word team, I thought I'd be fine with just one person and to be that connected to somebody and it needs to be a larger net. So again, I, I feel so lucky in that regard. Yeah. It, it's interesting how things happen. And you mentioned that this, that the word mycotoxin, when I got the word dermatomyositis, my ears closed. I, I mean, it could have been super califragilistic. <laughs> I dermatomyositis. It took me, months to learn how to say it <laughs> and it, it, as I was I went, <laughs> for my community when I was uh, talking to Maria right beforehand I had her pronounce her last name several times so I could get it because I'm like you guys know on the community here I'm such a creative talker and speller um, that strange words come out but one of the things that I found interesting and powerful was the need for uh, you mentioned how the doctors were able to um, help you think outside the box, which is important in this idea of healing that. So you've got this big word, you're learning all about it. You're overwhelmed by this big word. Like I said, it took me forever to learn how to pronounce it. 
what I'm grateful for on my team, and my team has grown over the time. Some doctors I'm still in touch with and others I know I could go back if I needed to. But one of the requirements, uh, definitely not listed, but now that I realize that's one of the things they all have in common, is this ability to help me think outside the box. So I don't get stuck in looking at that list of, at Dr. Google saying all these awful things any more than they get stuck looking at that list and saying, uh-oh, that's where we're headed. That's not the road. They're, they're much more open-minded about where the path is in a positive way. Like, nope, we're headed forward. We're not looking back at that list. So <laughs> that's one of the critical things I think is really important. We're down to like about the last five minutes, Maria. What are some last final tips you'd like to share and tell us more a little bit about your work and how we can help support you? So for the tips, I would just say from my own personal experience is the moving forward because I felt, I don't want to feel sorry for myself that I have this. And if I stop doing the things that fill me up and that I feel are important, then I will resent that I ever had this illness or this this immune issue. But if I keep doing what I'm doing and I feel like I find the ways to work with it, then I don't have something to resent or regret. I move forward, move forward a little differently, um, but I don't let it hold me back. I don't want to give it that power. I, I have the power in my life and I move forward with that. So with my, with my work continuing forward, um, I, I, I write articles about what I do and I am continuing to work and develop the solo show. And I have my website, mariafadiman.org, where it talks about the, the talks I do, because that's another thing I do, is I try and talk all over the country to let people know about what's happening, to get them inspired, and to care about their own environments and their own traditions. Just doing it with a whole big bag of pills when I go, but I, I make it work. <laughs> Awesome. Make it work. That's, that's what I, that's the one of the things I find is a, a very common trait of what the thrivers here in our courage club are. The ones that are label themselves thrivers are is like, yep, you know, it, it may suck, but I make it work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's it. So thank you so much for being on the show. This has just been awesome. I love hearing stories where people don't let their diagnosis stop them, that they keep on doing living their life to the fullest, regardless of their diagnosis. Everyone, if you know someone like Maria and you think we should him or her on the show, drop me a quick note over at understandingautoimmune.com. It's over there in the contact us portion, as well as if you're not a member of the Courage Club yet, be sure and join there. Also join the conversation on Twitter and at Autoimmune Hour and Facebook is Autoimmune Hour and Understanding Autoimmune Now. So I think that's about it. Everyone have a great week, whatever your adventure is, and be sure and join me next Friday night for another brand new episode. Enjoy. The information provided on LifeInterruptedRadio.com is for educational purposes only. What you hear, read, and see on Life Interrupted Radio is based on experience only. The information presented here should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on Life Interrupted Radio. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by LifeInterruptedRadio.com to learn more. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour, but maybe you didn't know I'm also an author, mostly nonfiction, but recently I delved into the world of children's fiction with the Pinky Chenille series. If you haven't had a chance to check out Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, go over and check it out at PinkyChenille.com. That's Pinky, P-I-N-K-Y, Chenille, C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E.com. Thanks. See you there. This episode is brought to you by MindfulnessInActionBook.com. To get your free four-minute guided meditation to relax, refresh, and renew in just four minutes, and who doesn't have four minutes? Stop by MindfulnessInActionBook.com now. 
This guided meditation is in handy MP3 format so you can use it anywhere, anytime. Download it now at mindfulnessinactionbook.com. Do you want to be a better leader? Have better relationships? Become more self aware? Be a better communicator? Hi, I'm Sharon Saylor, best selling author, professional speaker, and executive coach. And my life passion is empowering professionals to be the best that they can be. After years of working with professionals, I've discovered the seven things nobody is telling you that can cost you your clients, sales, and even your career. And I want to give it to you free. You've heard my show, you know my passion, and maybe we'll be working together sooner rather than later. So go grab this ebook now to find out the seven things that's costing you big time over at SharonSailor.com forward slash radio gift. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time, we say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if we thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing? So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, you say, thank you for listening. Join us at ProjectForgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness. Thank you. 